Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. We are confirming acquisition of your signal. You are live in 5, 4, 3, 2... Hello and welcome to another thrilling episode of Gardeners of the Galaxy, the podcast for all of the sentient beings in the universe who have a passion for plants. I am Emma the Space Gardener and I will be your host as we explore gardening on Earth and beyond. It's Valentine's Day on Earth, so love is definitely in the recycled air here in the Orbital Garden. And although we can't just nip to the shop and buy a dozen roses for our someone special, we're comforted to know that roses have been grown in space. Would a rose in space still smell as sweet? That was the question International Flavours and Fragrances Inc. IFF set out to answer in October 1998. Researchers at the Wisconsin Centre for Space Automation and Robotics, which goes by the unwieldy acronym of WCSAR, had developed a commercial plant research facility called Astroculture to provide plants with the necessary temperature, humidity, light and nutrients during spaceflight. Astroculture was designed to sit in the mid-deck of the space shuttle, which was where the crew lived and worked. IFF partnered with the Wisconsin researchers to modify the astroculture unit, incorporating their proprietary technology for sampling and analysing essential oils. They then used it to fly a miniature rose called Overnight Sensation on Space Shuttle Discovery Flight STS-95. Launched on 28th of October 1998, STS-95 was a 10-day space mission, and it was a fairly special flight for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it returned Mercury astronaut John Glenn to space. Glenn went from being the first American to orbit the Earth to being the oldest person in space. He was 77 at the time and a United States senator. STS-95 also took the first Spaniard into space, Pedro Duque. The overnight sensation plant that went into space was no more than 7 inches tall, that's about 18 centimetres. It had to be small as the astroculture unit itself was only 17 inches by 9 by 21. When it launched, the rose had two buds just ready to open. During the 10-day mission, the crew sampled the fragrance of the rose four times. They used a tiny silicon fibre coated with a special liquid that collected the scent molecules. Each sampling produced a different scent, although overall the rose produced less aroma in space than it did on Earth. Flowers evolved scents to attract pollinating insects and animals, and their aromas arrive from volatile oils, also known as essential oils. These highly concentrated extracts bind to olfactory receptors and tend to evaporate at room temperature. Plants will produce more oils when their pollinators are most active, so some smell more during the day, whilst others are night-scented. Other factors involved include the temperature, humidity and age of the flower, so with so many environmental factors involved in scent production, it's not surprising that a rose might smell different in space. After the overnight sensation plant returned to Earth, IFF scientists found that a significant change in some of the chemical components had occurred in microgravity. So the company averaged the four samples and produced an entirely new scent that was definitely not of this Earth. They turned it into a new Space Rose perfume note, which was included in two commercial products, a perfume called Zen, developed by Shiseido in 2000, and a body spray called Impulse, developed by Unilever in early 2002. I'm going to pause here for a second to say a big thank you to all my Gardeners of the Galaxy boosters. Every spaceship needs fuel to stay in orbit and Gardeners of the Galaxy is no exception. My rocket boosters support the show financially and there are several ways to do that. Just as important are my signal boosters who help me expand the Gardeners of the Galaxy community by following me on social media and liking, sharing my posts or by leaving reviews in their podcast apps. You can find out more about becoming a booster by visiting theunconventionalgardener.com forward slash boosters. The overnight sensation may be the only rose to have flowered in space, but it's not the only one to have made the trip. In February 2008, a two-toned pink rose, called Tournament of Roses, orbited the Earth more than 200 times on Space Shuttle Atlantis. Lance Walheim, author of Roses for Dummies, worked with his younger brother, astronaut Rex Walheim, to send the bloom aloft. The rose went into space in Rex's personal items, and the brothers had to solve the problem of how to preserve it for the flight. Given the time constraints, freeze-drying the rose to preserve it like space food was not an option, as it would have involved too much experimentation. Tried and tested options include putting it into silica gel and then microwaving it, or baking it in a kiln. 
In the end, though, the simplest method proved the best, and Lance simply hung cut roses upside down to air dry. That wasn't the end of the challenges, however, as the dried rose then had to be safely packed for space flight. On the space shuttle, NASA offered astronauts three different options for personal items. Anything in the official flight kit, OFK, was stowed for the entire mission, and that's where they would stow any items they wanted to fly but didn't need to access during the flight. So if you wanted space-flown keychains for your kids, they would go in the OFK, where they would be safe and sound. For things they wanted to be able to handle in space, astronauts could choose the personal preference kits, PPKs, or special flight data files, FDFs. Lance and Rex were torn between keeping the rose safe and being able to photograph it in space. Their solution was to send two roses. NASA would wrap one of them and stow it in the OFK, and the second would fly in Rex's FDF. To keep it safe, Rex packed that one inside a small plastic box. Atlantis launched on the 7th of February 2008. Rex nervously checked the rose in his locker and found that it had survived the bumpy eight-minute ride to orbit. He later photographed it floating near the window against the backdrop of Earth. Other than that, the rose stayed safely stowed in the locker. After Atlantis landed on the 20th of February, Lance took a tour of NASA and retrieved the rose. But that wasn't the end of its journey. It was destined for display on a float at the Tournament of Roses Parade in Pasadena, California. The rose was just one of over 12,000 covering the Bayer Advance float, which had a Wizard of Oz theme celebrating the 70th anniversary of the classic movie. The float included a yellow brick road covered with yellow brick road variety roses, but the space rose took pride of place as the only one that had truly been over the rainbow. So there have been roses in space, but will we ever see roses on Mars? When humanity invented telescopes and took its first good looks at Mars, we assumed we were looking at an inhabited world, and the features we saw there reinforced that idea. But our hopes of finding sentient aliens on Mars ended abruptly when the Viking landers showed us the Martian surface was a dry, rocky desert. Nevertheless, we haven't completely given up on finding life on Mars. Increasingly sophisticated rovers are patiently searching for signs that the planet was once hospitable to life, and that microbes may still linger somewhere. Dr Howard Boland and Dr Laura Sinti are bio-artists, exploring the concepts of culture and nature. In 2004, they introduced genetically modified cacti into the wild in Mexico to explore stories of bio-invasion, bio-pollution and landscaping with genetics. Then in 2007, they explored the idea of a Martian rose. Using the Mars Simulation Laboratory at Aarhus University, the artists exposed roses to a Martian environment for six hours. That included temperatures below minus 60 Celsius, atmospheric pressure of just a hundredth of Earth's, high carbon dioxide levels and UV light. Of course, once the rose was returned to Earth conditions, the artists found that it was frozen and that the formation of ice crystals had crushed its cell membranes. The rose petals had darkened in colour and wrinkled, and once it thawed, it was no longer stiff enough to stay upright. There are some plants that are able to make it through cold winters, pumping sugar into their cells to act as antifreeze, preventing those damaging ice crystals from forming. Once they've done that, they go into a state of suspended animation until the weather warms up. And as any gardener will tell you, roses are not included in that category. There's also the issue that plants aren't well adapted to very low pressure conditions, which interfere with turgidity. That's the water pressure inside the plant that holds its shape. You'll have noticed how they wilt so dramatically when they're short on water. So the devastation of the Martian rose was probably a combination of the thawing and the low pressure. The artists did try to revive the rose, but of course they could not. This was an art project and not a scientific experiment, and its aim was not to learn something new about roses on Mars, but rather to explore our understanding of extreme environments and what it may take to survive them. What would it mean to create life for Mars? What kind of life would that be? Should our goal be to make Mars habitable? It was quite a remarkable art project, and there are some truly beautiful photos on the Sea Lab website, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes for you. As usual, you'll find those at theunconventionalgardener.com. That's it for this episode, so all that's left for me to do is to wish you a happy Valentine's Day and tell you that I love you all to the moon and back. I'll be back soon with more space gardening adventures. Thanks again to my boosters for supporting the show, and don't forget you can sign up to the Gardeners of the Galaxy newsletter for new episode alerts and bonus astrobotany content. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Orbital Gardens, this is Mission Control. Confirming termination of your signal. The technicians have asked me to pass on that they are pleased with the results of your latest flower experiment. They say everything is coming up roses.